É, é pode... Might have to refresh. Cutting out. Yeah. The live thing. <laughs> Can you hear me? It has to be. <laughs> Better. Clearly. Oh. Better? Oh, well, 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 hopefully, hopefully it's working now. You can hear it. There's mix and printing. They print pretty much anywhere in the world, in Canada, Australia, the United States, and anywhere you want to print, they can reach your audience. And if you drop my name, Andrew Davis, in the message that you get 5% off your first order. So please use that if you need comic book printing. It goes a long way. I also am sponsored by BCW Supplies. Get my name, pop out of my comics, you get 10% off. Bags and forwards are expensive. To save yourself some money. And I have this t shirt that's up in red bubble at the moment. So you can drop that in as well. And that's all in the description above. And obviously, I have with me in my failed intro today, Martha Schwartz. So welcome back to the show. <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm doing great. You know, you know, this interview can only go up from here, it can only go up. Right. So, so obviously, though, we got you got a Kickstarter going on right now with Aliens West, and it is different from your other works. And so what is that entire comic about? Because it is a new property that you are working on. Um, it's more of a, well, I do a lot of fantasy sci-fi, but it's more of a science fiction genre kind of thing. Um, not very horror, but more of like... Uh, like the classic horror movies, but in the except in the old west, has nothing to do with cowboys and aliens. That's more of a Ben 10 vibe to me. This is just like what happens when aliens get stranded in the old west because we know that you see shows where they get, um, like Mark and Mindy, they're set into modern times, or even like there's a new show with an alien in it, and it's all modern times or, or Third Rock from the Sun. And I'm thinking. That's all fine and good, but what about what if they land in the old west where we have the resources, but it's not been discovered by humans, you know? Um, and so these aliens are crashing in in this world where they have to find out how to use resources that they have no idea what it's about, and the people that they're living with or living around have no idea what it's about. So, but the this first issue is just the setup, the where the aliens first come in and, and you know, take over the story, and it's going to have a little bit of um, some messages and meanings. It's got a little bit of Christianity into it, a little bit of working together as you know, as a family, as a unit, kind of little innuendos in there. So, I think a lot of people would like it. So, it's, it's a good setup. It's a good starter. It's got a lot of um, like even the resources. We'll see little things of how you know how it plays in with the modern world. Or, kind of like with the modern world with the aliens and with the western world so it's set in 1885 in near roswell nevada <laughs> so you'll get you'll you'll get a really get uh kick out of like the little into windows when you read the story <laughs> let's talk a little bit about this because it is not cowboys versus aliens and obviously when you shot me your entire thing and when i saw it i'm like oh man this is sort of cowboys and aliens but it's not it's not i promise everybody um but we i've seen things like that I and mean, everybody's seen you know aliens and human interactions right. and you have a very interesting spin on it so where did that idea come from because it has some similarities to things that people are familiar with to some degree but it's also very different where there is more of a learning curve and sort of saying these aliens are discovering what Earth is and what this new technology is. And so it's a cool concept. And where did that idea come from? 
oddly enough, well, my father loves the old westerns. He watches westerns all the time. Every time we go to the house, he's watching westerns. And um, I was watching a show, <laughs> The Beverly Hillblades, of, of all things. And it was set in the old west because, you know, they're the hillbillies and live the, they live in the west. And they're like, in the 60s, it was like they all wanted to do sci- um, cowboy or aliens movies and alien stories. And they're like, that's this is what we want to see. And I'm like, that's a neat idea. What about cowboys and aliens <laughs> and how they relate to each other? Like, you know, like the old classic horror movies. They're like, that's a neat idea because that's never been done. If you really seriously think about it, that's never been done. So oddly enough, that's... <laughs> Where, where the idea came from just watching old tv shows <laughs> yeah and obviously there's a lot of stuff going on in here i definitely want to dive into the story and i think one of the best places to start is sort of with russ wales who is one of the main characters and you know he's got sort of a small family farm he doesn't necessarily own the land and he's having issues with his brother his family left it to him and he's working the land and sort of barely making it by to some degree. And so what was this like really building him out? Because he's one of the main characters and obviously he's with his wife too, Mildred Wales. And you know, she's sort of keeping the peace and trying to make everything work as well. And so what was it like building those two out? Because they are very essential to this story. Yeah, she's she's sort of like the, the like I said earlier, the Christian values. She's like the, trying to keep the family together, keep the family stronghold. Um, the Trey guy, he's the brother, and they have a little we'll get to him. Stop time. doing it. How many times? <laughs> Go in little pieces. <laughs> okay, we'll get to him later. But the farmland we'll is to you, please. <laughs> the farmland is his, but he doesn't well the farm is because like his brother <laughs> owns the land and he owns the farm and they have this little conflict going and the odd spin about it is I was going to name him Ross Wells, but I'm like, that's too obvious. <laughs> so he's called Russ. <laughs> so let's even talk about this because obviously there's an alien component. And we're going to get to that in a second, but there is a lot of strife and I don't want to say brotherly strife, but economic strife, taxation, strife, political strife between Russ and you know, Trey, his brother, because there's conflict about the land, there's conflict about taxation, there's conflict about ownership and advocating and influence and a variety of other things that are going on that make it a very difficult political situation for Russ to manage and figure mm-hmm. things out. And that in of itself, you know, could be a very, very interesting story. And, it, and when I think of that conflict, I think of very much of Yellowstone in a lot of ways. And mm-hmm. so what was that like building this into this because that's just one layer of the story in a lot of ways um i i find it very odd that like i started this story and i haven't even seen like the new 1886 or yellowstone or something like that but it is it goes to a lot of the same lines um if it makes you feel better i am not caught up on season four of yellowstone so it's all right all right you we're in the same boat here yeah, yeah, but you're right. It, it has the same uh, feel and idea because, like, that, like I said, my father watches the old westerns, but you, all you ever see is like them with the cattle herding and um, trying to take over one's land or something like that. You see the little like, or or the black hats and the white hats and stuff like that. Or, um, but this one's going to be more about like um, trying to live, you know, with your community and how it builds up together and how they're all, you know, how to relate to one another without getting in trouble. And it's just, it, it, it goes deeper than the black and white, you know, the. Cause, cause it, it, it's very interesting. And I purposely have separated the aliens out of the equation for a second, because the conflict between Ross and Trey in many ways could just be where the story goes. No. And there's plenty of stuff. And with those two, that can be played out. There's plenty of stuff politically. And I don't think that, that, that that's how I would write it. 
and, and, and obviously I'm viewing your world a little bit differently because I like to write that stuff. I feel like you're giving too many of my secrets away. <laughs> it, 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 it's very much very interesting because I think people can relate to that and they see that. And it's the idea that the same political debates that happened in the 1800s and 1885 haven't evolved much in, in our society. It's just different issues. But the same internal conflicts and family issues have been around for centuries. And I just find that part of this so interesting because that's one component. And then you dive deeper down, which is we get into the alien side of things. And now we have aliens involved as well. And that also further adds a second, third, fourth layer, not to mention that life is just hard out in the West. Yeah, exactly. And well, we'll we'll be seeing a lot of introductions to like, um, because of course they're in a spaceship, they get to see the spaceship. You're gonna see a lot of uh, interesting um, introductions on that and how they're going to, uh, are they gonna meet the humans? What's gonna happen when they meet the humans? Um, it's going to have a little bit of a sad ending at the end of this first issue. I'm not going to give too much away, but it is going to be very cliche and very like, oh, my God, I can't believe that happened. You know, there's going to be a big surprise at the end. So I hope this gets funny. You guys are going to love this story. I'm not kidding. Let, 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 let's talk about cliche endings because I don't have a problem with cliche endings. I'm a huge wrestling fan, and I love the predictable wrestling ending. Now, some people don't. I do. I like the way things end sometimes. And I don't have a problem with cliches, for lack of a better word. Sometimes they're appropriate. Sometimes they're not. It just depends on if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so what is that like to sort of say, hey, you know, I'm following the tropes a little bit. I'm giving what people want because people sort of bitch about cliche endings. I think a lot of people are like, yeah, I kind of want it too. Yeah. But the well, this is gonna, but it, it still falls in the style of like Twilight Zone, where you're not going to expect this to happen, but you're you're gonna know it's gonna happen. You're gonna have to get an idea, but it's like, oh, that came out of left field. So there's gonna be a lot of surprises in it too. So, and then and then even to go further and backing out of the cliche ending, um, I am curious, and, and obviously you sort of have taken aliens, and there's been a lot of different versions of aliens that have been out there, and so. He sort of had them looking like amoebas, sort of <laughs> being very transparent, you know, sort of showing their internal organs a little bit. And mm -hmm. what is that like? Because it is sort of a simplification of an alien, but they still look humanoidisk, I guess, if that's what, or like a humanoid, but they're transparent. You can sort of see their brains and things like that. And so what was that decision? Because it does show elements of their simplicity, but it also still has them being developed, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, I always see like, I, 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 when I tried to design the characters, I had like, I sketched so many ideas and I'm thinking like, you know, the classic three-eyed monster, the purple peak, the leader, stuff like that. But I'm like thinking, well, what about the alien greats? Because I'm thinking, I wanted it to hit like the Roswell vibe, obviously, because it's setting, its whole setting is around there, but you know, it's not saying, well, it's not Roswell yet, you know. But um, so I wanted to make them like Alien Grace. But then I thought of the old classic 50s movie, The Blob, where they, you know, the blob took over and started eating everything with it and whatever. I'm thinking, well, wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be neat to have it look like the blob, but it can turn into human form or the alien grain form. And it also helps them hide. So they're trying to hide from the public or whatever, so they can turn into this liquid form, and then they can turn into this alien creature form too. So it's kind of like a disguise, kind of in a way too. But a lot of that idea came from the blob movies. <laughs> so I'm thinking a lot of classic movies when I did all this. <laughs> yeah, and then obviously that sort of changes when they land and they're dealing with humanity, and they're sort of being exposed to a variety of new technology, mm -hmm. and so. What was that like? Because obviously there's already enough political problems in this town, but as far as there's enough political problems between Ross and Trey, and will these aliens sort of get thrown into the middle of A, learning what this technology is, figuring out what resources are around, because I'm presuming they want to just get back or continue where they're going. And well, this opens up a bunch of possibilities where the aliens can be vilified, they could unite the town, they could side with 
people. They could wind up trying to make their home on earth, for lack of a better word, or they could be dealing with a lot of different things of prejudice towards them. And so it really opens up a gigantic sandbox in a lot of ways of what can happen, what can happen, and they could be the great divider or uniter in a lot of ways. So what is this like for you? Because they're, they're landing in the middle of something. And well, it's an open rain in this book with what happens next. Well, you're, I don't even have to, you just went through the whole bygone book. Not too much though, because I want, I'm like keeping those little secrets, but you're going so right you know, to You can avoid the question. I could ask a different one if that's better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, you, I mean, you answered the question right there because, like, there's just there's a lot of things running around in my head of how direction I'm going to go. But the main goal is how you know they're stuck on this planet and they want to go home. So, what do they do to get home and how do they find them? number one? How do they find the resources? Because you see in the, the new movies or the whatever, Mork or whatever, I can just name whatever you know, many of the shows, but they had more resources or they had, they were so far advanced and these aliens aren't as far as advanced as we're going to know or as we'll know, but. um, And it's also the time period is that, I mean, the 1885 in the wild west, nothing against the wild west, but it's not a resource rich land or it, it, technically, I mean, the wild west is, but it's not accessible resources. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of resources, but humans don't know about it yet and alien, these aliens are not from the planet so they don't know it yet so it's like how it's like think of um what's that show survivor <laughs> think of survivor and how are they going to do they work with the humans to try to well, make you need to find a hidden immunity item guys that, that's the key yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's that's the key to this entire book <laughs> It will be. <laughs> but this one is a setup, so I'm not going to go too far. We'll be talking about this later when hopefully book two comes out. I mean, you guys fund this so, one. Right? Let, let's, let's even go into some inside brass a little bit because obviously I interview a lot of people in the comic realm. And I've done writing and writing articles and other things, breaking down comics, manga, anime, wrestling. And sometimes when I write, something writes itself. And sometimes, you know, you have an open sandbox and you actually have to steer the ship the way you want to steer it. And I've done both. And so I am curious about this because this is very much an open sandbox world. And I sort of was, I guess, pre-emphasizing this in my last question is that, is this story writing itself or are you steering a ship through so many possibilities? Because it is very interesting when sometimes a comic writes itself in a lot of ways, you know. I'm working on a project that relatively writes itself and it has one direction, but mm -hmm. there's other people who have comics that like, like Jilly, they can go in 15 directions and they could all work at the same time and they pick one. And so I think, I think like Ruben Romero with the illusion, which is a good example of that, where that book could have gone in at least three or four different directions. Mm -hmm. And I think Ruben picked one. I don't think that book wrote itself. He picked a path to go down and yes. You know, that, that that's just the way I interpret the book. And I could be wrong, but I don't think he minds me throwing an interpretation out there. Um, right. So what is that like for you with this? Is it more writing itself or is it you choosing? Because there's a lot of stuff in play. There, the main, it, it's both. I would say it's both because it's going in one direction. The key is to have them, they want to get back. That's the main goal. They want to get back. Um, how they get back may be the directions trying to follow that path to get it up to where they need to be. But because have I wrote it, I have an idea what the story is going to be, but there's a lot of paths going to, you know, like this, this river, this river until the one path that goes into it. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. I'm not going to push too much further into the story because I do want people to actually back it. Um, Sorry, I'm breathing. Um, but I do want to talk about rewards with this because you got a lot of cool stuff going on with this as well. And so you obviously have the digital seed seekers and we're going to talk about that in a second in a little bit, uh, cause I am curious what's going on with that. I know you got stuff going on with that, but you also have that, you know, digital, you have aliens West digital, 
You have the physical copy of the book. You also have the Steph and Care Ann version of the book. And that's what this thing looks like right here. And I am curious about that cover because there's a bunch of versions of that cover. So there's this regular cover and version. And then there is a limited hollow foil to 20. And then there's a limited metallic 10. And so what is that like? And what prompted that decision? Because we all know my background where I'm a variant collector and I do buy and sell comics and I love exclusivity. So what was that like? A, getting Steph Wilson because his books do sell and they do attract people to back Kickstarters. And then also really going down the hollow foil path and then the metallic path and actually making it super limited and increasing the price of it. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I had the book before, um, the Seek Seekers. I had a campaign before this, and uh, I, that's how I found actually two campaigns before that Steph came in. Nicest person I ever met. I said, Hey, you know, I'd love to have a cover. So we got together, and he did the cover for me on the last campaign, uh, the Seek Seekers campaign. I think it was called Finding Happiness. And, uh, when he did that, and then I asked, oh, can you do this one? Because, you know, you're very talented, and I'd love to have you on another cover. So, um, and I, I I knew about the draw, so that helps a lot. That helps a lot. But even, like, a lot of people say, you know, you're most of it, too. So that makes me feel good. <laughs> but I, the last campaign, the Seed Seeker campaign, I did Hollow Voice with it, and they look fantastic. So I'm like, you know, this with his artwork on that. So let's even talk a little bit about that because <clears throat> obviously there are business decisions that are made in Kickstarters and then there are personal decisions. You know, I made a business decision in my Kickstarter with my metal card that I was offering. And I just know that, that my friend DJ is going to be big in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. that, that I just know it. I, I can spot town for miles out. And I know I'm going to make bank on my portion of the metal cards. He's going to make bank on his. And I was going to make a lot of money. I'm going to make more money on those metal cards than I made on my Kickstarter, which is crazy. Um, but what is that like to say? I know that this book is going to help get me funded and this cover in particular. And then also increasing the hollow foil element of it because that makes it even more rare. And people love hollow foils. They love yeah. metals. They love anything that's even more exclusive and shiny by, by, by nature. And so what was that like as a business decision beyond just looking awesome? That that's what I um like that last cover, and I'm this one's gonna be just as good. When I saw that cover, I wish I had a copy because I had one more copy left. The mostly the background is beautiful because I like emphasize the picture, the beautiful you know woman that he has in the front. Or I got it right here. We got it right out. Gosh, I forget her name already. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> and, and you took me to, to remember. That this is I like it. But um, mostly the background will be all shiny. I mean, and that almost sold out. I have only five covers left, especially the hollow foil. I prefer the hollow foil. Metallics are okay. Metallics, I might look at the dress because she has that shiny dress. So that's why I limited very on that one because, you know, that would pop. A lot of it pops. So that, that's the best decision to make on that with the, with the hall foils because a lot of people love the foils. Um, I also had a um, coloring book one, but nobody's really going for that one. Steph gave me the permission to do the black and white to do a coloring book, but I don't guess nobody wants to color. <laughs> yeah. This is sort of what it looks like a little bit. Right? Yeah. And so, and so let, let's even talk about this because obviously, you know, exclusivity is king on Kickstarter. By, by, by nature, it's, it's king in, in general and everything. But in particular on Kickstarter, you know, I like when a book is limited to 150. I just picked up a 50 print run hollow foil from Big Dog Inc., um, Tom Hutchinson, and that book looks beautiful. Yeah. It is beautiful. And the only reason why I was mad at Tom is that I didn't get it fast enough. That my, was my only complaint because it is a beautiful book. And I mean, hollow foils are just beautiful. They look clean. And it's also when it's like mint. And, and, uh, it, and so obviously that's something that I think is very helpful. And this is probably what got you. And it's going to get you funded by nature just because 
it's not anymore Steph Wilson. It's a limited Steph Wilson. Right. And I'm very critical and Steph is on my show. But what happens to cover artists sometimes is that when they have a lot of covers, it's how many of those covers are out there. And so if there's only 20 or 25 of those hollow foils, then that is a more limited Steph Wilson book. And mm -hmm. if there's only 10 of the metallic, people who are true Steph Wilson fans are going to want these books. And so it's very important that I think people understand that is that this is one of those things that definitely is really, really smart to do. And then obviously, you know, if you're a true Steph Wilson fan, you know, the black and white, you get to color it or you could leave it as a sketch, which is what I think a lot of people want to do. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on with that. And that really, I feel, is going to make your campaign work in a lot of ways. Is that yeah. That's a big draw factor to it right now. I have only five hollow foils left. So, you know, whoever, you know, get them all before they're gone. Because I only had, like, I think it was only limited to 15 or 20, but that was it. No more. Yeah, and, and, and even to talk about this, so what is that like to say, I'm not printing another five and that I am keeping it at a hard limit for that because that also protects the people who bought it. You know, when I buy a variant and there's 150, I expect only 150 of those books to be yeah. in play. And that's all I'm printing, yeah. It, it only goes to that, to how many. Well, I'm going to go at how many get sold. And once the Kickstarter is over... It's whatever I sold. So, and no, you cannot buy it in stores. You cannot get it in my so, this, like this is This is interesting. So are you going on the premise that you're only limited to 20, or there might be less, or are you going to print 20 of the hollow foils? I'm probably going to stick with the 20. So if I have a couple left, it's only going to go to the conventions. And the reason why I ask that is that I know people who say, look, I will only print up to 20, but mm -hmm. if there's only 15 people who ordered, you know, that's what I'm going to do. I have a, a Mandy book that is a Dean Yates, um, you know, um, his uh, character. And there's like only like 25 of those books because legitly 23 people ordered it on a Kickstarter and they printed two extra. And so there is only 25 of them. They were only printing what was ordered. And it is a super rare book that nobody knows that book at all. And then when you see it, it's, well, it's expensive. So it's, and it's, it's hard number too, which is super cool. Um, but even going further into this, obviously, I think this is sort of the cover A in a lot of ways. And that may or may not ruin what's going on in the book. I'm just saying it may <laughs> ruin something that's going on in the book. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, cliche ending, perhaps. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention that, and I have one left, but I have a, you can be drawn into the book. And I had the guy ask, because one did, oh, I forget his name, but he says, well, if I get drawn in the book, will I be a character or will I be a background character? I'm like, I'll make you a background, I'll make you a character. You could be in the story, dude. If you're okay with it and I get permission... I'll put you in the story. We'll see where it goes. Because like you asked earlier, I'm like, do you know the direction? Well, I know the direction, but, you know, I can put these characters in the story. So I have one left. So if you want to be in the book, guys, <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> You'll be so, part of it. As long as I have your permission, because I'm not going to, you know what I mean? Because you, I still will put the disclaimer, all character and personalities. <laughs> So right. to, to, to even talk about this, because obviously being drawn into a comic is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of cool because a lot of times what happens is that in these campaigns, and I think this is fascinating, is that you're like, you'll be a background character. Or I had a friend and he has a Kickstarter where you could be drawn in as a background character, you could be drawn in as a monster, you could be drawn in as a creature, as one of the heads on, on a creature. You could be drawn in, you know, with dialogue, you could write your dialogue to some degree in the book. And so you're saying, hey, you know, I'll just throw you in as yes. a character that actually has a component in the story. And that's kind of a cool thing because I think it does make it a little bit different mm -hmm. because the drawn in tier isn't new. Everybody's done it in right. their campaigns. It's now a matter of you're saying, hey, you know, I'll make you a part of this story in a bigger way. And that yes. changes the game a little bit, I feel. 
yeah. So this person's like, oh, yeah, I'm in. And I'm like, that's when it shot up. Well, whoop, but now it's like staying. <laughs> And so and so, I think I think that's something that that is very very interesting, very different. And obviously, we're going to talk about seed seekers in a second here, but I do actually, and I'm curious because I just did my Kickstarter and I funded successfully, and you know I did okay with it, and it's basically what I needed and a little bit extra for 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 some further infrastructure development. And I'm actually good probably till January of next year as far as finances, minimally. Um, including when, when I add a podcast element into it, uh, which is super, super helpful. And with sponsorships, I should be even good for, for a while. So I'm good for, for, for the next year, which is pretty much all of, of, of season three, which is nice. Um, but what is this like for you and Kickstarter? Because you've run a bunch of them, but Kickstarter, and, and I don't know if it's the norm where you go up in the first week, you do a little bit better in the second week and then, or you do pretty flat in the second and third week. And then you shoot up in the fourth week because I've heard stories where people have funded in the second week and then they've been flat for weeks three and four. And I've heard a lot of different Kickstarter experiences. I've also heard that everybody's Kickstarter experience is different. So what has that been like for you? Because you obviously have a lot more data than I do. Um, this is my 10th one. I found very weird, you know, because this goes by so fast, you don't realize how many you've done. Um, this one I did ask for a little bit more, only because it covers the cost of the hollow foils. They get a little bit costly after. I mean, and like I tell in other interviews I have, I'm not ripping you off on these uh, um, tiers because like $3 for a PDF, most people are charging 8 or 10 or 5 I'm doing the 3 you know, so I'm not ripping anybody off. Um, I put like $25 for the hollow foil, but the printing is cost very costly. Um, I did make a mistake on the last one, but I'm just, I'm doing this by myself. So I'm learning little things like, cause like the last one I did, I sent them out and I was like rushing them out. Cause I'm like, I knew these people were waiting and I wasn't putting them in the right bags. I was mixing them with stuff and they were bending and stuff. So this is going to be, I'm taking a handling with great care kind of thing. So let's even talk about shipping. Cause, cause, cause obviously I run an eBay business mm -hmm. and sometimes my shipping is slower than, 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 than I want it to be. But I also make sure my items are packed beautifully. I bubble wrap them. People in the last few days have been attacking me on my shipping costs. I charge $11 on eBay mm -hmm. and you could think that I'm expensive. That's fine. Everybody that's fair game. Um, and, and it's a fair observation to some degree, but guess what? Your books arrive perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, you know, I haven't produced a comic, but at some point either this year or next year, I produce a comic and my shipping might be high on my Kickstarter, but you know, what's not going to be a problem. Your book isn't going to arrive damaged. Right. And the whole thing is that do you, you get what you pay for. And mm -hmm. so if you want your book to arrive damaged, Hey, you know, it's I'll send your book for a dollar. I don't really care, but you right. can't expect it. I'll legitimately put a stamp on your book and send it in the mail. If somebody wants it that way, I got no problem doing that. And you don't want panic shipping. I'll take care of the shipping on that front, you know, but it's the idea that what is that like you figuring out? Because I don't think people care if you're like a week late on that point, if their book arrives perfectly, I never mind. Yeah. Three, yeah. Months, three months late. If my book arrives perfectly. They, they don't get too griefy about the lateness and thank God, you know, cause I usually put down, it might be a little later because mm -hmm. of, you know, the printing, I have to wait for the printing. you like, even the last time I had to wait for the hollow foil because it's, it's stuck in a boat in China. Uh, but, um, when I ship them, I try to ship them. At, well, when I listed it, I put it at $5. I stupidly put $5 except international. I try to go higher. And then I find out international went up because of COVID. Because I got a lot of people from Australia. And I'm like, I was trying to ship it out to my one friend in Australia. But he's a good friend of mine. I have a solution for you for Australia. But we uh -huh. Australia. Huh? I got a solution for you for Australia. Yeah. And the UK. What? <laughs> so so this is actually super cool. Um, I just heard Mixum does fulfillment in the UK and Australia. So they can fulfill books directly and ship within those countries because they have printers in those countries. And so uh, they can actually fulfill your books internationally. Yeah. And so I'm producing a comic and I'm going to have backers and open it up to people in the UK and Australia 
and I'm going to be using Mixum. And while they can't get all the little tchotchkes and stretch goals, I'm going to find an alternative stretch goal, like an extra book specifically for those regions that mm-hmm. those backers are going to get. Um, and so I'm finding a different way how to do international shipping. Does that mean I could ship to India? Probably not. But if I'm opening up the UK and Australia and Canada, because Mixum has a business in Canada, I mean, those are three major Western countries. And I just found that out. So that's a big deal. That's a game changer mm-hmm. in a lot of ways for a lot of people. And so, and look, you know, it is, you, you don't have to fully print with Mixum either, probably. If you have like legitimately like 25 backers in Australia, that's a solution. Yeah. You, could, do, you could do a very small print run with Mixum. Well, so far I have like two, so. I have to look at it because when I went to ship the last one, I was like a hundred dollars because of the COVID. I'm like, are you kidding me? And then the poor guy's like, well, I'll send more money. And I'm like, it's fine, it's fine. But I have he's a really good friend of mine, so I'm gonna make him something and send it out with him. So I have the little tidbits and stuff to send him. But I mean that that became a little bit of a problem. But I'm I'm like you said, thank you because I'm discovering little obstacles to get around those. But I just discovered that and they're a sponsor, which is even crazier because they don't tell me any of this. This is this is the ad right there. Guys, international shipping sucks. My sponsor, Mixum, has the solution. Oh, and by the way, you get 5% off on your order. That's the ad right there. But no, they have to do it their way. <laughs> no, I love Mixum though. They're, 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 they're a great sponsor. Um, but anyway, anyway, continue. Uh well, what else were we talking about? <laughs> okay. oh, yeah, yeah, this, this is going great. <laughs> but no, 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 it's it's um uh, so 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 because this is one of the things that I think is very um interesting is going further into all the entire Kickstarter because obviously you have a lot more data than I do, as I was stating. And what happened in my campaign is I my first you know few days at the two hundred, and then I got nothing for like ten days, yeah. and then. I started sort of bitching about a troll and being like, what the hell is wrong with the comic community? Just like everybody seems attacking. And then a bunch of people were like, oh, yo, man, what's going on, man? And a bunch of people started paying attention, which I guess Facebook liked the negativity post and pushed it out to a bunch of people. And then I did like $400 in like two days. And then it was flat for a while. And then in the middle of week three, I got fully funded. And then it was flat all the way until the very last like three days of my campaign. Yeah. So what is going into all this? Because every campaign is different. So how has well, your campaign been going? Because it's 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 just like I don't know the answer to that question. How it's supposed to be going? Yeah. Well, I hear try not to make it negative. Always try to keep the positive. Focus the positive. That's what I kind of do with it. Even though I'm like, well, it's a straight line. I'm like, how do I get that straight line moving? And I'm like, well, I try to talk it up. Like I did the little video today, talk with you today. I try to um, make sure that people are aware of what's going on. Um, Cause also you got to realize that Facebook holds back a lot of your ads or you try to share, they cut off a lot of the shares. Um, so you just got to, got to look at other venues and try to keep it positive. Never look down the negative. It's not easy. Yeah. I tell you that right now. It's not easy. Sometimes well, let, let's talk a little bit about that too, because obviously social media and not, not to get too political, it is an evolving art form in a lot right. of ways. It's strange. Um, <laughs> and so Facebook is weird. Facebook ads are not the same as they used to. You know, Instagram has obviously decided to shift more to video. You know, YouTube is the second world largest search engine. People's podcasts and including mine do not get as much reach as they used to. And then some get more reach and then people artificially inflate their numbers. And I know a variety of shows that say they do X, but they don't Mm -hmm. um, and they don't convert. And so I've discovered that. And I I take a different approach where I actually did very little media surrounding my Kickstarter. Instead, I did a lot of media for the sake of doing media. And that's my battle plan is to get on a lot of podcasts to get my name out there versus get my Kickstarter out there. So I think a slightly different approach where I believe the name Andrew Davis, the name Pop Anime Comics is worth more than my Kickstarter's name is worth. Um, mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, if all of a sudden I build up a huge name where I drop something and somebody loses my name and then it gets associated, it will trickle down and be more like a funnel. 
And and given the fact that social media and where it's going, that's kind of my approach. And I did okay, but what has that been like for you? Because media has been a disaster. It's, it's one of the problems I hear about all the time. And I think that's why a bunch of people wind up buying spots on my show because getting media now is complicated. Mm -hmm. It, like I said, it's like, it's, to me, it's draining. It's like hitting brick walls sometimes because of the fact that you're trying to get your stuff out there and share. And uh, you, you, it's very limited because of the Facebook ads and stuff like that. So um, like you said, trying to mix it up or trying to write, reach out to other venues or other things, you know, it, it helps opening the doors without being, you know, you don't have that limitations and stuff like that. So, but the, the big key is just keeping it positive. If you start saying, Oh, you guys aren't looking at my stuff and I don't think it's right. And, Oh, and this is my bad thing. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this guy's got 20 million people already backing him. And I'm just sitting here as a poor lowly little artist. <laughs> I'm going nowhere. I used to think that way. And I'm like, I can't do that no more. I always look at the fact that these other people are sharing my work. They're there supporting me. I even say like my last post, I'm like, I want to get this funded, not for me. I want to get it funded for the people that are there supporting me because they want to read this one girl even said, I want to see this so bad. And I'm like sitting there like, my direction. I have to get this funded because I want to do it for the people that are there already. And hopefully, yeah. You know. See, it's weird for me because because I had Pat Shan and Ben Dunn back my project, mm -hmm. and so I was trying to get certain people to back my project mm -hmm. just because it's kind of like I could be like, oh, I got Pat Shan to back my project. I got Ben Dunn to back my project, mm -hmm. and it's also cool for me because a lot of people who have already been on my show are like, hey, I want to back your project, and some people. I know for a fact, like, hey, I want I, you've been good to me. I want to take care of you because you're obviously doing a service to, to, to everybody in the comic community where you're interviewing a lot of people and you're giving people who deserve an opportunity an opportunity. And you're also helping me to sell a bunch of books in, in a lot of ways. And I think that people to some degree feel that they're like, yeah, well, you have been on your show four times. I owe you 20 bucks, you know, mm -hmm. to get on for a fifth time. And I need to make sure that you're taken care of because you're taking care of a lot of other people. And so I understand why I got back. It was a mixture, but also there are people, there's about eight people who I don't know who they are. They've never heard my show. They're like, can we do it in March? I'm like, you could do it in April. Like, <laughs> It's whenever you want to do it. Like yes. I'm a very reasonable human being. And I think that, you know, I just think unfortunately a lot of people just didn't see it. There's a bunch of people that I know are having bigger problems in their life right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hopefully the next round I'd be like, hey, you know, I know you're having an issue this round. I get it. Um, but hopefully, you know, for season four, season five, you know, they'll be like, cool, I'm in. And it's, so. Yeah, because like, like I said, I did 10 campaigns before. And there's sometimes where you see the same people come back. And then it's like, where are you at? You know, are you are you going to support me this time? And they're like, no, I have some issues going on. Or and those I kind of like. Sometimes you don't hear from them at all, but you got to sit there and think. You can't think negative. You just got to think that, you know, they, the door, you don't know what's on the inside of the door. They're probably going through a lot right now, or they might pop up and support you later. So I always try to, you know, I keep, I, I put my nose to the grindstone and think of the positive. And even if, even if, I'm not going to say, you know, bad things. So even if I don't get funded, it's always a good time to do it later. Maybe Aliens West is not the time right now. Uh, put it out there again later, four or five weeks down the road, or put it on Indiegogo. I don't, you know, I don't know, but I get that hope. But I still, again, I try my, I have, I'm put my nose to the grind as I try to get it funded because of all the people that are there right now, you know. So yeah, it, it's tricky, and, and this is something that the, that I've briefly spoken about on a few shows. But it took me 18 months to want to figure out how to do a Kickstarter. Be because because one of the reasons why is that there's the fear of fail. Yeah. And, and and it's a big issue in a lot of ways. Because I was like, what if I fail? What does that do as far as my show? What does that mean? What does that mean as far as you know, public eye? And it was very, very weird going into it. And then you know what is was that about 540 bucks? I'm like, you know what? If I fail, it's probably not that big of a deal. Yeah. Because the campaign stays up there. It's still a good marketing tool and I'll probably just punt it till next year 
and I'll go a different direction completely. And I'm sure I'll do fine. But I, I got funded still, though. But I was saying to myself, you know, what if I don't? And it took me 18 months to get over that because I was like, hey, what happens if I don't make it? And what happens in this circumstance? And so it's it, it's tricky. And Kickstarter is a very, very, very complicated entity. Right. Because it is terrifying in a lot of ways. And that's how I felt about <laughs> Kickstarter. So, you know, it, it took me 18 months to even say, hey, let's do a Kickstarter. Yeah. And I remember you had a little bit of a problem when you were trying to get it out the first time. But yeah, they 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 they, they didn't like something that, that everybody does. And, and I've seen it on like four or five different campaigns and since and where where they didn't like my my digital me selling a digital bundle pack of other creators that I had permission from. And I've seen that from other creators doing that. That's right. where the idea came from. I'm like, Yeah, I see that. Too. It's, I actually, I actually put mine in some. <laughs> it was, it was, it was whatever. I have a feeling that if I had two of my titles, and that what I would do is that there, there there's ten ways around it, but I'm probably never going to do that ever again. Um, and I'm probably, I got better ideas for for what I want to do. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm not really all that concerned about it, and my next project isn't going to require that. Well, they're getting a they they're getting a little tough now, Kickstarter, because like I remember when I put it in, I'm like automatically it's ready to go up, and now they have to wait two or three weeks because they have to look and investigate. Because a lot of people took advantage of Kickstarter, so now and it's understandably so that they're just going to look harder into them instead of just saying, okay, you get it right away. You know, you can't just make a macaroni and cheese recipe and like that one guy <laughs> and get a million dollars for it. <laughs> You have to really yeah, go yeah, yeah. I, I think I think Kickstarter is, is getting tougher. I think Kickstarter is also getting more interesting, and it's it, it's going to be a very interesting world. And I am curious about how you feel about Kickstarter because Kickstarter has gone. I feel in three directions. I feel Kickstarter has gone and maintained the idea that you're kick starting a project. Mm -hmm. So you have an idea. You might not have the funds to do the idea yourself, and you're asking everybody else to do something. Then you all get a product in the end which is what I think Kickstarter's intention was. It's also become now very much people say, look, you know, I am a small publishing house and this is paying the publishing house, this is paying the art and this is paying every component of, or paying me back or it's giving me seed money for round two. And right. then round two gives me seed money for round three and then Kickstarter four gives me seed money for round four or five or it allows me to get the trade paper back and then I make my bank on the trade paper back with a little bit of a distribution on every single book. You know, that, that that's the second model. And then the third model is the preview order form. Where people are like, look, my book's done and I just need a distribution system, which is what I am in a lot of ways. I am a pre-order form and I am a booking form. And that's what I've kickstarted. It is crystal clear what I am. Um, mm -hmm. And so how do you feel Kickstarter has evolved? Because... It is a very different platform because it is all three of those things at once. I I honestly think it's in a better direction than it used to be because like, and a lot of you see a lot of people using it now. Even the mainstream comics are using it now, which I find that very like you know you guys are making enough money like Marvel. <laughs> you find it icky, right? <laughs> I think that's a good word. It's a good word because everybody yeah. gets that word, right? Yeah, I was like, that's Disney. Come on, you got the money. So, what are you so, I don't know how controversial you want to get, but I lost you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm back. I'm back. So, so <laughs> I find it very interesting what places like Scout and Bohemoth, yes, yeah. like publishing are doing, where they are mitigating their risk, where they publish Kickstarter books in their companies. But they go and they allow the people to fund on Kickstarter and then they go into distribution rights. And I think it's a very interesting world. And even Keen Spot does it and a few other companies are doing it. And that's a whole fourth model is that if you know you're going to be in distribution to scout, you're like, I'm going to go on Kickstarter first, take care of my Kickstarter people, maybe recoup some of my art costs. And then I'm gonna have distribution on the back end of Scout, and that's a whole different ball game. And that's a fourth model that has emerged. And good on those companies for figuring out how to do that. Yeah. yeah. But it it raises questions at the same time. And the questions it raises is that 
would Scout and those companies be willing to produce as many books as they could without Kickstarter or Indiegogo or any other crowdfunding platform? And that is an amazing question to ask all of the people who have those companies saying, are you that reliant on Kickstarter? And that's my only question to them. If I have any of those people who run those companies up on my show, that is the one question that we're asking. Because because it is it's an important question to ask. Yeah. It's, it's it's important not to embarrass them or call them out. It's important to understand how healthy this industry is. Right. Right. Now that now that I've gotten us both in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Blah, 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 blah. We, we, we can talk about seed seekers now. <laughs> Good leeway. <laughs> Completely going right into it. It's a much happier world. You, you, you said we go, it's like six flags. You go up the mountain and you go down and you go and you, and you get to a, to a, a different ride. <laughs> uh, Clearly, I transition just beautifully, just beautifully straight up. Uh, well, this. Aliens West has nothing to do with Seed Seekers. Um, I did probably throw a little bit of things here and there, like, you know, because you're Not yet it doesn't. Cash. Not yet it doesn't. It's a crossover <laughs> coming. We all know it. Yeah, you never it's know. Okay. You never <laughs> know. But, it, I mean, you know how, what is the Easter eggs? Uh, you're going to probably see a little bit of Easter eggs in it. But, um, anyway, Seed Seekers is a story, and we'll go back to our old days where we used to have our first chat, but... It's a story about uh, there's this prince and he's in another world and they have to take him in their world, which is a fantasy world with trolls and elves and stuff like that, and help rebuild a community that was dying. So um, the hero, though, is um, he may have the seed or the key to help bring the kingdom together, but it takes all the other characters to work together to help build the kingdom to grow, not just the king itself. Um, and it's still ongoing. I have... I did these finding happiness, the one that you just showed. Those are little side stories because I had, I'm doing one called The Great Big World. And that was actually I had that last year where they go back into his world, which is our world, the, the Western world, the people, the comic book world, <laughs> to uh, he has to get closure of his family because he hasn't, he hasn't seen him in a while because he's sucked into this world. The, the fantasy world. So they go back into his, his world. And I had a different artist helping me with um, that because, you know, I wanted a little bit more tighter art. But I don't know if my artist is really, I'm relying on him too well. So I think he hopefully. So, let, let's see if we can talk about this because what's cool about Seed Seekers is that you have a main story and there's a big, big world that is being built out there and it's been evolving every single issue and every single trade and every single campaign. But then you also have these side stories mm -hmm. and I kind of view it and, and stop me at any point where I view it that it's kind of like a long RPG game, but yeah. then in the RPG game, you can go on some side quests or in a video game, you have a mission, but then you can do some side quests to get like a cool item or get a cool new weapon in the game or a cool new magical spell, or just have a, fun time doing this side quest that you need to get done. And that's what these, you know, finding happiness and things of that nature. And it just enriches the world, but you don't need it in the world completely to understand and Yeah, it. yeah. So what is that like? Because it adds to the world. It gives more to the true fans, but it doesn't detract away from the main story. Yeah, it's more of a character development and because, like I said, you got the prince and stuff like that, and you kind of will understand his story. But what about the other characters and how do they relate? What do they have in their insight to help him grow? And how do we learn from each other? Because, like, I like to read. I like to, um, you know, be think of fantasy stuff like this. And then you have a person who's all mathematical and, you know, creative that way. You know, you have so many different talents out there. So that's what's going on with these is like, you're going to learn more about the different characters and how they relate to help this king and help the world we built in that. So that's why that's a little side question stories like that. But yeah, I'm yeah. to direct it back to the great big world because we want to get back on track with that story. And, and even we're going to talk about that, what's coming down the pike in one second. But one of the things that's also really cool about these side stories is that it also gives another skew. And it mm -hmm. also gives the idea that a lot of companies do one shots. 
And so when you then go into trade paperback or you go into an omnibus, it just gives more content to throw into that omnibus. You know, Zenoscope, you know, I'm a big Zenoscope fan. They have one shot books. And so they might have an Oztail, for instance, and they have five issues, but then they throw that one shot into the back of the sixth as a sixth issue, essentially. And then it expands the graphic novel, for instance, and or they have omnibuses. And I'm reading a lot of this stuff on comicsology. And so that's very helpful because now it further completes the entire story. And right. so it's very, you know, useful in that realm when if you ever get to that point or you go down that path where you have these things that then you create a big omnibus of all of these worlds and then you have these one shots in it and then you could give a complete addition to somebody. Exactly. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. And that's where it is. But that's both that one side story of the finding happiness and now the, after Aliens West gets to it, the next book I'm going to do is Great Big World Part 2. So Yeah, so let, let's talk about that. that. That's what's coming next down the pike. And so what can people expect with that? Because a lot of stuff's going on. <laughs> and I don't know everything. I don't know everything. So so, so don't ask. Yeah. Um, well, the the... His name's Ian, so he's like the king of their world. And so what had happened in the earlier stories is that they had to... He was sent into the our, our world because he was being protected from the evils of what was going on in their world. So the girls come and bring him back. Well, in this great big world story, he gets a little upset because he's trying to find his place in their world. He's finally realizing, I don't know if I belong here. So I'm kind of missing my family. I want to know his adopted family. I want to know what they're doing. So he gets to go back into this new, um, his original world to see his family. But the other characters are like, you know, they got to try to convince him to stay in his world or keep an eye on him. Because if he goes and leaves again, the world's going to die because he holds the seed of keeping the earth back together which we'll find a later on in the story why he's important. But I'll get to that much until later into the future. But that's what the next Great Big World book, it's going to be a lot more about, yes, he's going to go into the, his world, back to his world to see his family, but now we got these characters, more people are going back into his world and find out, you know, this world is a lot different because they just had a little inkling of that when they went to look for him, but now they're going back in there and see a whole lot of more stuff going on and a lot more changes. So that's what the next book's going to have a little bit more direction for in the book. Yeah. Too. And there's a lot of fun stuff going on with, with that and everything in that realm. And so very, very, very cool to, 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 to that degree. And I don't want to ruin too much of what mm -hmm. was about to happen with Seed Seekers and the Great Big World Part Two and everything in there, but, but I'm sure that, that it's going to be, because I've read parts of Seed Seekers, and it's going to be fun. That's all I'm going to say. It's going to be brightly colored. It's going to be very, very interesting, and I'm sure I'm sure the Prince slash King now is going to have a somewhat happy resolution. We, we, we can only cross our fingers, right? <laughs> yeah, you guys keep with me, because you're going to find out for a lot of great surprises coming down the pipe on this story, so Seed Seekers is not forgotten, but it's, it's going to be coming, and just like Aliens West, it's got a whole bunch of stories coming, but it's going to be one great story in the end. <laughs> and and so obviously, I'm not going to push too further, um, but but I do want to talk about a few things that, that that outside of Kickstarter and Aliens West and Seed Seekers. And I am curious how you view COVID and cons because things are still up in the air with conventions and also trust and a variety of other things and. Obviously, I live in Connecticut, and I don't think I'm going back to a con ever again. Um, mm -hmm. just, just on a business level and on a personal level. And I am doing more than I've ever wanted to do in comics outside the con scene. And I find it a lot less cluttered for mm -hmm. me to make connections and do interviews and do efficient work. And I could devote more time to actually writing or booking an interview instead of having to figure out how I'm going to go to a con and build out a panel. And so I'm curious how you feel about where cons are going and even COVID and how things sort of have shifted a little bit, if at all, in your world. 
Well, in Florida, I, I find it odd. Like, they had Megacon here, and I went last year, and I was surprised that with and it was COVID was still hot and strong. This was before the Amicron, Amicron one came out. And there I'm was a lot of there. New Transformer. Huh? The new Transformer, Omnicron. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bad joke. It's going to get me canceled. No. <laughs> well, that's saying there's another one coming down. I don't even know. A, B, C, D, E. But um, and there was a lot of people at that convention. So, but as far as um, advantages of it, I think there's some, for as a comic book seller or artist, there's some good advantages of it. I see a lot of the same people. I there was one person that was there for day one. I've been to the conventions for like five years, and this person keep coming back to look for me. So that meant something to me. You know what I mean? So it's like. Finding that audience. It's hard, though, sometimes, because there's times where you're just standing around doing absolutely nothing. But there's also times where you're making connections with even other creators there. So I'm half and half. My thing right now is, like, if this doesn't get funded, I'm not going to go to the convention because I just can't. Yes. I'm at a stage this- where even when I produce my comic, I don't feel like spending the money on a table yeah. or spending the money on a Shopify store or spending the money on more merch from my eBay store right? And, or spending money on ads and going up on Upwork and finding somebody who's really good at Facebook ads, hiring them, give them money, whatever there is, and then ad costs and let them do their job. Mm-hmm. And so like the way I see it is that I want a bigger digital footprint and that's the pivot I'm making. Yeah. And I'm part of the great digitalization pivot 2.0 and it affects me and when I'm looking for a job and a variety of other tactics. And so that's something that is very important to to, to me where I made a conscious decision to go down that route because I just think that's where the money is. Maybe I'm wrong. wrong. Not to cut you off, but um, I was going to emphasize, yeah, because I think that's a good idea because half of me is like saying that I rather focus on the me- um, media because you get a lot. I get a lot more attention on the media because you get more. You know, you can reach out to more of an audience. Sometimes you're sitting there, so that's why I say it's a half. For me, it's a half and a half. I'm not always. I don't break even when I go to these conventions, and sometimes I feel like I'm wasting my time there too half the time. So it's like. So am I be upset if I don't get to go to the convention? No, because I always have the outlet to focus on. So I I think you're making yeah, it. It's, it's for, for, for me, if I want to go to a con, I'll go and I'll do a panel for free so I get a free ticket. But it's also, I'm going to stay local because one of the things that I've always done is that I'm going to a local con so I don't have to buy a hotel. Maybe I spend $30 on Ubers, which, and I go for two days, maybe it's $50 on Uber costs. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I got a free ticket and I'm doing a panel, two panels, and that was it. That's why when I was in D.C., I went to Awesome Con, I went to Otaku Con, and then I went to like two or three smaller cons in the DMV area. But my, right. whole, my whole thing is that I'm not interested now in, you know, going to New York Comic Con. Actually, New York Comic Con's in my backyard, technically. Um, but it's the idea that, yeah, I just would rather throw the money into actual product and, I think that that's the whole thing is that there's no certainty that I'll break even and I'll be a hundred percent honest. I'd rather stay in my house. <laughs> like, like my house is nice. Like, you know, you know, my parents' house is nice. Yeah. I could order Starbucks and run a Facebook ad and sell books in yeah. my house. It's like, you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but that's how I feel. So well, to even stem from that, if I had to do a con or if I had to pick a con, I'd rather do the smaller conventions. I'd rather go to comic book stores because I'm like, you get more of a one-on-one and they're not looking at like anime tables and cosplayers or anything like that. They're looking at comic books in general. You know what I'm saying? So this is, this is how I feel about smaller cons is that, so I was at a con and they had Scott Laudel there Mm -hmm. and I'm talking about generation X with Scott for like 30 minutes. And I love generation X, like the old generation X. And it was fascinating because I brought him an old foil cover, books worth a dollar. It looks cool. And he's like, oh man, I haven't seen this in like 10 years. And mm-hmm. at a bigger con, you can't do that. And so from, from a fan perspective, I love smaller cons. I love the fact that they're cheaper to get into. I love the fact that it's about comics. You know, they also have, you know, 
fun deals. And then also I discover talent where I discover up in local talent and I discover talent that's sort of tri-state area that might not get as much attention at a bigger con. I'm like, yo, what book do you recommend? And I'm like, oh, this was awesome. And that's how I feel. So, so I agree that, you know, if I produce a comic this year, next year, whenever it is, I'm probably going to do smaller cons first. Hey, I might even do a flea market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what it is? I want to go to places that, that, that don't have things. I'll do a wrestling show. Because at a wrestling show, I'm going to have zero competition. And I will build covers exclusively related to my book with wrestling on it. So it's going to be like, oh, man, this is kind of cool. It's a comic book. It's four bucks. No problem. <laughs> and I'll sell a fuck ton books. And that's the name of the game, right? Is to sell books and sell a lot of that. So that's, that's what I want to say. That's funny that you mentioned that because, like, I, I want I – I'm not looking too heavy into it, but that's another thing I'm looking at. I'm, I want to make a book about – well, I did. I made a book about Owen Hart. So I'm trying to do wrestling comics too. Because I had one with Owen being like the... It's, imagine Owen with uh, Phantom of the Opera. I'm not going to give too much on that. but <laughs> I did that story back in 2000. And I never finished it. And I, ha I even had the whole Bret Hart and Vince McMahon angle. It's a really good story. I'm like, And I never finished it. But I always had that I wanted to do that. And then I had one about China. I wanted to do one about China. But, well, I would ask if x -Pac is in it, but, but that, that, that might get a little too. Uh, yeah. Too <laughs> well, it, it's not going to be called China, but you know. <laughs> Anybody who's a wrestling fan just got that joke. Anybody who's a wrestling fan just got the joke. And, and you don't need to go any further into that joke. Um, it, it's one night somewhere. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Yeah. Um, but 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 I, I have a cover that that, that at some point that Wilson's gonna do for me, and uh, he doesn't have to, but but I would like him to do it. And uh, but but I'm not gonna let anybody know what that plan is. But obviously we've been talking for for a little over an hour, and I do want to give you a chance to promote yourself. So where can people find you? Where can people find you on social media? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Where can they find? Seed Seekers, where can they check out your website? Where can they check out the Kickstarter? And where can they pick up your comic books, prints, arts, commissions, anything that you sell? Uh, hold on. Oh, I don't have paper. I should write it down because the thing is, it's like, it's hard. Oh, hold on. Because <laughs> my website is, and it's going to change. I'm going to change the name because everybody gets after me. I can't, this pen, I, I can't write it. It's called www.schmartsgraphics.com <laughs> My name, basically. S-C-H-W-M-A-R-T-Z Z. Graphics.com So that's my website. It's not really updated. I want to hopefully get it updated soon because I, you know, with me and my art, I just don't have time to even catch up half the time on that. But that's my website. Um, so a lot of it schmarts. <laughs> Um, you go to Facebook, you look under, under Schmartz, S-C-H-W-M-A-R-T-Z. That's my Facebook. Um, Schmartz Graphics is my plug-in at Facebook for my business center kind of thing. Uh, same with Twitter. Or Instagram is Schmartz Arts. No, that's my Twitter, Schmartz Arts, S-C-H-W-M-A-R-T-Z-A-R-T-S. <laughs> So just type in Schwartz, you're gonna probably find me everywhere on the internet. So yeah, no, that, that that that's good. And then obviously your Kickstarter links up above, and people can click that or down below on YouTube, Facebook up above, or down below again. I'm not exactly sure on um, where you know, you know how how it operates on both those platforms. And obviously, and I've been saying it, I'm gonna keep saying it, is you have to support indie comics, and the way you do that is you back Kickstarters. First and foremost, you know, when you back a Kickstarter, you're helping to make that book happen. You're helping to make that project happen. And every dollar goes into getting that comic to its goal, which goes into printing, art, stretch goals, into, you know, paying artists, paying creators, anything that, that's relevant to, to producing that project slash book. Um, furthermore, if money's tight 
or a particular book is not your cup of tea, um, if that creator has a website and they have other books, you should go pick up books from that website because while something might not be your cup of tea, I am not a big horror guy, but I do like a lot of other things that are not horror and certain writers have horror books. I don't pick up their books, but I will pick up another book that they do that is more my style. And there's nothing wrong with that because that indirectly also supports them and supports their projects. Um, and even when I don't like a horror book, I will share out projects. I will interview a lot of creators talking about these things. Um, even if I'm not saying, hey, I'm not a big horror guy, but I really like your other book. But it was great. Um, and that's all right, too. You don't have to back everything. You don't have to like everything. But what you should be doing is sharing it out on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You know, shoot somebody a DM. Be like, hey, this might be for you. You know, if you have an interview show, you should probably interview people or you can just quickly mention it if you're doing something and it does go a long way. Um, so please go do that. It is very important. As far as I'm concerned, obviously Mixum is a sponsor. Andrew Davis, 5% off on your order. They do, I think they are starting to use fulfillment in Australia, the UK, Canada. And I think that that's what they're doing. I'm not 100% sure. But if you use them, they might be able to fulfill your books in certain countries which is very, very, very cool. And it's an obstacle around international shipping right now. Um, also, BCW supplies, bags and boards are expensive. 10% off goes a long way, guys. I mean, inflation is expensive. It is an affiliate link. I do get a commission out of it, but that money goes into making this work. Also, if you're looking for some new merchandise, you go buy my Gundam t-shirt. It's making fun of the most interesting man in the world, I'm Ray from Gundam and Taco Bell. So if you like any of those three things or all those three things, please go buy my T-shirt. Red Bubble will take care of you. You can actually pick whatever color you want it in. You could do black, red, purple, yellow. You could do black on black. You could do white. You could do yellow. Anything you want, you can do it because uh, Red Bubble allows complete customization. And again, that money goes back into this show as well and keeping it alive. Um, so that's kind of everything with me. Go support me. I appreciate it. I need your money. And if you feel really inclined, just give me your credit card and I'll take what I need. Um, you know, you know, I promise I won't be too greedy. I'll just be the right amount of greediness for everybody. So please, if that's how you feel about me and you would like to give me your credit card and you don't have a problem footing the bill, I will happily accept. Um, but on that note, I'm going to give you the final word. Um, yeah. The same like what Andrew said, you know, be a big, strong supporter. Even not, if you're, if you, this is like my, your cup of tea, my Aliens West, if you're not in the Aliens or whatever, there's a lot of Kickstarters out there to look at for. Um, I have 10, I have created 10 Kickstarters, but I've supported 200 and I'm going to keep supporting more. I'd rather throw my money to the creators out there. You know, um, people, some people like to shop at Etsy. I probably shop at Etsy. It's about us. It's about working, you know, together. And I'd rather give the money to you guys, to the people out there, the creators. The I love your stories, and I'm very happy to be part of it, you know. There'll be some hard times, but you know what? I still got your back. I always will be here, and I hope you guys will have my back. Aliens West is a very good story. Um, I think you guys will enjoy it. It's something different from me. Um, I love writing. I love drawing. I try the best that I can, and I try to make it work for you guys. So definitely check it out. If you can't support, please share, like, you know, subscribe, <laughs> whatever you can do. If not, I do have Seed Seekers coming out after this. I'm hoping to have part Great Big World Part 2 in May. So, yes, so keep watching, you guys. Remember Schmarts if you can. <laughs> and I believe that is a wrap, everybody.